So next up, we have Federico Alfonso Mendez Sanchez, uh, who's the Director General, and Luciana Luna, <laughs> Luna Mendoza, who is the Director of Ecology at HESI uh, in Ensenada, Mexico. Um, in the production of our honoree video, someone described Luciana and Fede as salt of the earth, and I think that's very fitting. They're about the kindest and hardest working people that you'll ever have the pleasure of meeting. They'll share their work toward the comprehensive restoration of Mexico's islands and will tell us about the eradication of goats on Isla Guadalupe and the amazing natural recovery that followed, as well as the extensive rare pine, palm, and cypress recovery efforts that are ongoing. Welcome. Morning, everyone. It's um, amazing to be here. We're really honored and humbled to receive this award from the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. So we're really grateful. And especially the cherry on the cake is sharing this with Kate and, and Peter. So thank you very much. And uh, we really are here, you know, we're, Luciana and I were spoke, spokespeople, we say, from, from a, a large group of people that's been working on island restoration in Mexico within our group, but also from the Mexican government agencies. And, and it's, it's, it's a really, really, really large group. So uh, Mexico's islands, uh, we have 4,400 islands, uh, different types of ecosystems. So those little dots, it's just uh, to show you that we have lots of islands, uh, like, like the Philippines in numbers, or like Greece, for example. And it's different types of ecosystems, temperate islands, desert islands, but also tropical ones. And Denise did a great job on giving us a tour. I'm just going to add a little bit to that. This is Cedros Island. Denise already talked about it. This is the fourth biggest island in Mexico of the Pacific coast of the Baja California Peninsula. Uh, then we go to the Gulf of California. This is Espiritu Santo Island, desert island, uh, kind of different type of setting, uh, blue colors in the water like the tropics, but it's in the Gulf of California. Then we go a little bit south, like the central Mexican Pacific, the eastern tropical Pacific. This is Clarion Island, the most remote island in Mexico, a 1,000 kilometers from the mainland. Uh, this is part of the Revilla Gijedo archipelago. And also the truly tropical islands. This is Banco Chinchorro, uh, an atoll in the Gulf of, uh, in, I'm sorry, in the Mexican Caribbean. And all the amazing biodiversity that we have on these islands, the northern elephant seals, they've been highlighted already, but also, uh, endemisms. There's lots of endemisms in, in the Mexican islands. This is a, probably one of the few island endemic deer, the, the Cedros Island mule deer. Other cute mammals like the foxes. Here we have the Espiritu Santo ring-tailed cat. The babisuri we call it in, 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 in Mexico, or the caco mixtle. And there are special things like the Santa Catalina rattlesnake. Note, no rattlesnake. And then also islands are amazing uh, because of their existence, things happen. So they, use, they are used by, by fauna as a stepping stones, also by flora. And so like, for example, the Revilla Gijedo archipelago that I was mentioning, it, it was probably thanks to the existence of that archipelago that green sea turtles migrated from the western to the eastern Pacific. So that's, that's amazing. And also lots of seabirds. So probably most of the work we do it's because of uh, protection to seabirds, and seabirds are like um, an unequivocal relationship with the islands. So you have islands that are in well shape, and you have lots of seabirds. So lots of seabirds in the Mexican islands as well, everywhere, like from from temperate species to tropical species, like the boobies. And Mexico is a mica diverse country, and it's important for different groups of, of fauna. For, for example, for seabirds, it's really, really, really important. We are third in diversity, just after the US and Chile, and also lots of endemisms in seabirds as well, just <coughs> after New Zealand. And um, just to give you an example of the importance of islands in Mexico is that at least 8.3% of the whole vascular plants and uh, vertebrates occur on its islands, and many, many are unique species, endemic species. But as has been discussed already, the biggest threat to that is invasive species. So from 24 confirmed extinctions in Mexico, 21 of those have occurred on islands. And about 17 of those have because of the invasive mammals, particularly rodents and feral cats. So like 80% of extinctions in Mexico have occurred on islands and because of invasive species. So that's why we do what we do, and we started doing a lot of uh, um, um, of science. So what, what are the restoration priorities for the Mexican islands? And, and, and setting up a group like HESI that really, really uh, moves and push forwards for these 
important um, restoration actions that are needed. And th so did, we did this like a national prioritization about which islands go first. There's so many of them. Uh, but you have to go for the most, probably the most biodiverse, the most important ones in terms of uh, endemisms, or, but also in terms of cost effectiveness of those programs. There's also been international recognition that the Mexican islands are important. This is a work by Nick Holmes, who's somewhere there, uh, doing a, like a, a, a global assessment of which islands we have to target on removing gaseous mammals that will be really relevant for, for global biodiversity. So there's 10 Mexican islands there. Some of them we've done already. Some of those are, are in making, in the progress. And this will benefit 17 populations of 14 threatened species. So um, I'm not going to go into details of what, how we have done it or where we have done it, but it's just a summary about Mexico's island trajectory. And, and this is like a, a big overview for the past 25 years now that he uh, has, has been around and that this work has been you know, going in, in Mexico is about 60 populations of invasive mammals have been removed from the Mexican islands. Uh, we've targeted 39 islands, and of those, 30 are already free of invasive mammals, so all invasive mammals have been removed. And if you see on the map, the, the, the um, yellow squares are where we're working now, so we hopefully, by the end of this year, early next year, finish with uh, cats on Guadalupe and Socorro. Uh, goats on Espiritu Santo, and also cats and goats on the Marias Archipelago on some of those islands. So it's about four islands to almost be clear from invasives and, and to start doing active restoration, as I will tell you about. And of course, this is a long story. This is about 60,000 hectares in way of restoration. So we remove invasive mammals from these 60,000 hectares, and, and things are sta starting to happen. Your recovery is occurring. And, but there's been lots of, uh, of investment there as well. So uh, funding is, is, is key to keep these programs going. Island work is remote, it's complicated, it's, it's, it's costly. So that, that really needs to be the, one of the main, main, the main key targets to, to keep on going. And then lots of benefits to endemic species. Um, for, from those uh, eradication programs I mentioned, we benefit over 200 endemic species of all the different groups, plants, birds, birds, reptiles, mammals as well. But usually, uh, removing invasive mammals is a big step, but it's not the only step to keep recovery going. So we've moved into active restoration that Kate mentioned a bit about that. It's that we just keep on going, and we have to have this vision about doing a comprehensive restoration of the island ecosystem. So that goes for the birds, for example, in some islands that the eradication of the invasive mm -hmm. mammals happened like 10 years ago. The birds were around, but they weren't coming back to the islands. And so, well, we, we said, well, well, why they are not coming back if these islands are safe places now, again, because there's no predators now. And so we, talking about collaborations <coughs> and partnerships, we got funding from uh, the Monroe's and Settlements Restoration Programs to start a cyber program in Mexico. So we started doing social attraction techniques. So we deploy decoys and sound systems on those islands where there's no invasive mammals now and uh, like recreating a colony to let the birds know that the islands are safe, ha safe havens again. And we did this with, um, you know, over the course of probably 12 years now. Uh, we provided extra habitat, nesting habitat, using artificial nests. And the story here is that we clear the uh, invasive mammals from the islands, and then we started with this active restoration um, work and we already have recovery in the Baja California Pacific Islands, which are the, the, the ones here in the, in, in the proximity, is that from 27 extirpated colonies from those islands of nine different species, we have already recovered 23 of them. So it's 85% recovery. We're aiming to 100%. We'll see some of those recoveries were thanks to active restoration. And, and also the great thing is that it not just the recolonizations, but also the appearance of new colonies of different species. So we have recorded 12 new breeding seabirds on those different islands. But then, keeping on going, sometimes active restoration is not enough. So uh, we started attracting uh, black-footed albatrosses to Guadalupe Island using social attraction for about five years. That didn't work. The birds were around, but they, they trying to, to nest on Guadalupe. Feral cats got them early in the 2000s. And so we started this, again, by national collaboration. Partnerships are really important. 
uh, even political um, situations as well. We use the Trilateral Committee for Wildlife and Ecosystem Management that comes from NAFTA, now USMCA or something like that. Uh, so we did this translocation project over the pandemic. In 2021, we uh, transported birds uh, and, and eggs from Midway Atoll all the way to Guadalupe Island. So imagine that trip. And that's the, with the idea to um, repopulate Guadalupe Island with black-footed albatrosses, uh, but also to give them a chance because of their main colonies in the Hawaiian Islands are being targeted because of climate change and especially sea level rise. And then to secure all this investment and these recoveries and these conservation gains, all those dots that you sh I showed you on the map about the islands we have already uh, removed in basic mammals, we need to protect those. So that's why we have been implementing a, a wide nationwide island biosecurity program, which is let's prevent at all costs that those eradicated mammals or other species come into these islands again. And so we've been doing this in, in close collaboration with Mexico's government. You saw my, my, my friend and colleague, uh, Israel Popoca, who manages Guadalupe Island. And so we, we have this partnership with CONAMP, with the Mexican Navy, to, which has, are two key actors for the islands in Mexico to prevent species getting into the islands again. Again, partnerships. We have this amazing bina binational biosecurity working group. We have working groups for almost everything. We, we really, as Peter said, we are family. We really love to get together. So we have the biosecurity working group, the cyber group, the plants group. So, um, this is really uh, a work in, in the making of, of a big efforts of a big group. And so to kind of put our feet on the ground and to make this really happen on the ground and keep on going is to work with uh, island communities. And so that's a key part of what we do as well. We do a lot of uh, environmental education outreach with the local communities on the islands or on the islands close or on the mainland close to the islands. We do this. We love to play and, and, and do this with the kids, but also with the adults. It's mostly fishermen on those islands. And um, just as a summary, and, and, and somebody, well, Peter also said that we have to have a clear vision. So we have this clear vision that for 2020, 2030, we have to have all the Mexican islands free from invasive mammals and like biosecurity really working. So it's just around the corner, right, 2030, it seemed part of far away 20 years ago, but hey, you have to have a vision. That's ours, and, and, and this is a commitment, not binding, but a commitment that we did in the Honolulu Challenge from the IUCN. It's the decade of ecosystem restoration, so we, that's, that's our focus, and that's where we're trying to go. And then I'll pass it along to uh, my colleague, Luciana, which is going to talk to you about an example, which is Guadalupe Island, an amazing island. So thank you so much. Thank you. If you hear some snoring. <laughs> so just uh, talking about uh, Guadalupe, Guadalupe is a biosphere reserve. It's the fifth uh, biggest island that we have in Mexico. It's a volcanic origin. It's very far from mainland, so pre-oceanic. Uh, that's why we only have plants. We have a lot, a lot of endemic species, including pan, uh, plants, uh, land birds, seabirds, and invertebrates. Unlike the channel islands, I wish we had a, a Island fox, but we, we don't. We don't have native terrestrial mammals or amphibians or reptiles in the island. So this was a great opportunity to start a very comprehensive restoration program since 2002. We haven't been able to do that in all the islands. Some, some islands don't, don't need that intervention for a long period of time. And some, um, you only go and do an intervention and then the island uh, by itself can rebound. It wasn't the case for, for Guadalupe. So we start working there with invasive uh, mammals for, uh, thank you, for species, uh, uh, focus on species and, and the restoration of habitats. Uh, so again, uh, for the collaboration, so National Park Service and CONAM given the similar, they, they share all the endemic plant share and fauna that, that uh, they were between the Channel Islands and Guadalupe Island, they named it as sister parks many years ago and this has um, gave us the perfect excuse to have the binational collaboration formalized to address the challenges more e effectively and efficiently and together achieve better, greater conservation success. So this, as uh, Fede was saying, uh, a big, um, we're very grateful to be involved in this collaboration group. We have learned so much from many people in this, in this um, room. And well, what happened is something similar what um, 
about, we have been hearing for Peter and, and Kate about the degradation of the islands. So the, problem, the main problem for Guadalupe for the vegetation was the introduction of feral goats and the end of 1800s. And that, uh, well, talking about Pinus radiata, so the Monterey Pine, there's only five native populations in, in the whole world, three in California and two in Mexico, one in Cedros Island, the other one in Guadalupe. And from a study from 2001, two of uh, Rogers and Vargas, a, uh, a trinational collaboration, they uh, estimated that were only 220 individuals left of the pines, which was quite dramatic. And not all of them producing viable seeds, so it was a big problem of um, very patchy distribution. So um, we needed to to remove the, the first step was to remove the feral goats, so we removed those. Uh, the island was free of, of those animals by uh, 2007. And then the recovery started to bouncing back. So what's great for the um, Pino Radiata, you can see here all the new individuals. And also for the cypress, the cypress is going a little bit slower because the, the, the trees grow slow, slower than pines, but it's still a lot of um, recovery. But Again, um, the forest was decreased to maybe one seventh of the original uh, distribution. So, but those were recovering uh, uh, quite well naturally. But there are other species of the island oak that they're not recovering as well as as the the other the pines and the and the cypress. We only have 15 individuals of, of these ones left. There in Mexico is only on Guadalupe Island where we can find it. So. Uh, so for um, species like this one, you need more active uh, re restoration programs. So this is one stepping and using, as uh, it was mentioned, it has been mentioned before, all the information that was available. We were lucky that in Guadalupe, and compared to other other Mexican islands, we do have a lot of information. And I know there's all the collaboration that we have had for all this many um, decades, I will say, many, many years. So we use a base as a reference model, the, the work from Tom's, the, the map, and also uh, Moran, all the descriptions of where the plants used to be, how extensive used to be the forests or the vegetation communities, and also some information of, um, for example, going with Steve Junak, and he mentioning uh, Senecio Palmer used to be so rare in this area and now is recovering very well, and we should be seeing that one now maybe in this cliff. So all, using all that information, uh, collaboration with colleagues, um, Jesus Vargas and, and Jose Luis Navarro from a uh, Mexican um, institutions saying, okay, the pines of this uh, patch, they have very low genetic diversity, so maybe you have to mix this ones with that, uh, the seed from this side to the other side, so it's in all that information. And then uh, all the information that the landscape or the system is, is giving you as species that, who can miss a Cianotus arboreus walking, I mean, they're like big shrub, and it wasn't recorded before just because of the feral goats. So that was, was, was found in 2004 by Steve Junek and John Randall around the pine forest. And now it's just everywhere. It's so obvious that it was part of the, um, the landscape of the pine forest and the cypress forest. And others had the Artosaphilus, which was uh, found like 100 years ago. It was only one specimen collected, went to a uh, collection. It was lost. It wasn't ever fully described, and now it's, we have only have one individual. We, we have the hope that we are getting more. So that one is being described by Marta Ceseña. And then we're using all that information to know what to produce at the nursery, uh, where to take that, those plants, just to try to connect, for example, and here see the cypress forest, just to try to connect with our plantings, all that area. The pines, which were recovering uh, very fast, like around the adult trees, but not much in the regional, um, the whole uh, coverage, so trying to planting those. So it's a comparison of uh, trees that were out 2016 in the, in the, at the top of the same ones now in the last year. Other activities such as uh, managing the natural recoveries so are very dense and very high risk of fire, so trying to, to do well management of the natural recovery. Uh, a lot of this is at the pines, but a lot of that um, individuals are very, very close, they're not growing, and they're just affecting the, the adult trees, so just removing those. Using that material to do soil restoration actions, and well, yeah, keeping, um, and try to lower the, the risk fire with the fire bricks. And then jumping into 
protecting seabirds. Uh, well, the study with feral cats, they have been there for more than 100 years, and, and so far they have um, likely causing the, the extinction of endemic one, the Guadalupe storm petrel, and also some lambers, some endemic subspecies that we used to have there, and then heavy, very heavy predation on the seabirds that we still have in the place, including the uh, barrel nesting nocturnal seabirds, which are the most uh, susceptible to predation by feral cats, as the Guadalupe murelet. So the Guadalupe murelet is uh, similar to Scripps murelet, uh, very um, only relies mostly in Guadalupe for breeding and to another uh, island, San Benito, but most of the population depends on Guadalupe. And it used to be um, with the, the, the cats that were only restricted to some of the islands that are cat free. And you cannot have a full glimpse of how big was the damage until you see them coming back. So we set up a fence and now we are removing the, the cats from all over the island, but looking just uh, starting with the fence, we, uh, at 2015, we found only two uh, burrows in this area, and now you can see in 2022 there are more than 600 in, in that area. Um, and well, this is a story, the restoration has just begun, only for Guadalupe, but this is an example for, for many islands. We're aiming to recover original coverage, we, are, we know that it's going to be very, very hard, but at least that's the goal that we have. And not only trees, but all the other species. So active uh, management, well, for the natural recovery and the, all the, the work that we're doing, just trying to decrease us also the, the risk of fire. And to keep on going with this uh, collaboration, to get the expertise, as Peter was saying, everyone has something to, to, uh, to add new ideas, or even the question, the burning questions that they have us and, and they let us think and just trying to do the things uh, the better way each time. Um, and this uh, also collaboration with the national government and CONAFOR and Flanquilla, which are the, the donors as well for the, this um, vegetation work, the challenges that we, we all share. And well, still to answer many, many questions. We are learning, we, are, um, we have learned a lot, we still are, and well, that's, that's it. Um, uh, that's it. We well, we just want to thank all the collaborators that, that we have, including and thanks to you again for the the word from the colleagues and in Ensenada and in La Paz. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One one question. Oh, yeah. oh, yes. Okay. Let's take uh, one or two questions. Morgan. Hey there. I'm so impressed by the work you've done. I mean, one thing you guys haven't had the opportunity, many of you haven't had the opportunity to see, but the amount of irrigation that they put in just to get some of these restoration sites, running the PVC pipes for miles across an island, across the crazy slope, so impressive. But one thing you didn't mention is all the new discoveries that you had, like the new Manzanita population. I was just wondering, like, your juniper, Juniper population, have you had found any new plants and have you had any luck of reproducing that manzanita that was discovered? Let me just repeat the question real quick. He was just uh, complimenting them on all the infrastructure that goes in to do this work and asking about rediscoveries. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, for uh, manzanita, unfortunately, we only have one individual, so we're keeping that, that one, um, yeah, just going once in a while and sing with it to it and all that we, we do have some clones on, on the, the nursery just in, in case and waiting for for another one hopefully uh this, that one came out after the last fire so we're hoping that it will be more with other species uh yeah we're from the the our discoveries we're trying to produce on some those at the at the nursery just taking those out but yeah but the, with the manzanita is just being described but yeah, there's other as a pseudonaphalium that hasn't, well, I think it's, in, in, it's being described right now. And there is an, another one, the Cyanotus, that used to be, it was um, named Cuniatus and then uh, Crassifolius, but now we're not really sure. And we think that maybe it could be something similar. We have still some questions to, to answer that maybe the genetic analysis. Thank you. We'll, t we'll take just one more if, if y'all can hang with us. Karen? I just wondered, what is, do the ring-tailed cats eat um, eggs? And 
And how do you know that they're native? She was asking about the ring-tailed cats and whether they eat eggs and how you know if they're native. Thank you. Uh, Philip, do you have more information? Okay. Yeah, the, the ring-tailed cat is present on Espiritu Santo Island, which is off the coast of uh, La Paz. And it's, it's an endemic species, so it, 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 it's, it's a herbivore, so it, it mostly, omnivore, I'm sorry. So it mostly eats, uh, you know, like plants, fruits from 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 the desert island. Uh, we haven't recorded any predation on like seabirds or or land birds present on the island. So I think it's 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 mostly kind of a herbivore uh, diet rather than. So it's 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 not a problem because it's it's an endemic. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right, now let's. <laughs> <laughs>